Vermersh, uh, <laughs> presenting our, uh, the, the many body entropies and entanglement with uh, polynomial many measurements. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well in the back? No? Can we check the, no, it's, it was actually maybe higher? No. Maybe I sp just speak louder. Oh, now, yes. Okay. So uh, uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers, of course, for this uh, wonderful opportunity for me to be here because I, uh, it's obviously the first time I attend a, a machine learning conference, and uh, I've learned so much. Thank you. Uh, kind of, uh, it's much easier to, to learn about this in. in in live in a conference than reading papers, especially with my background. Uh, so uh, today uh, I will discuss um, about uh, measurement protocols for, for quantum processors. So it can be uh, quantum simulator or, or quantum computers. Uh, and what we like doing is try to uh, accumulate uh, a massive data set from the quantum computer. So it's a classical data set. And then we have some tricks to, uh, to measure uh, quantities that uh, we think are interesting to measure, in particular entanglement. So I do think there are uh, opportunities to, to find connection with, with machine learning ideas, and I look forward to, to your feedbacks about it. First, because uh, we use, uh, sorry, a massive data set, as I said, so there's a lot of data to analyze. And also because we can provide uh, from this data uh, physics properties uh, and these physics properties are highly non-trivial. So we, we measure typically entanglement uh, on quite large systems. So maybe in turn, these physical properties I could imagine could be used uh, to somehow represent your states in, in a better way. So I'd start with uh, uh, what I hope is a gentle introduction to, to techniques to, to measure entanglement in a in quantum computers and simulators. Uh, I will skip uh, kind of a mathematical aspect behind the protocol. My aim is to show you what is a state of the art in terms of the experimental recipe, uh, typical numbers uh, for statistical errors and so on, and typical limitations. And then I will move to the, this new result, which we are quite happy about, on how to uh, extend this existing toolbox to really measure uh, entanglement and, and related quantities in very large systems using uh, very few uh, physical assumptions. And uh, I forgot to mention that this work was done in collaboration with a very nice team. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, in particular, to mention Lorenzo Piroli, uh, who uh, really helped me and helped us to. Uh, have faith in this, in this idea that one can eventually measure entanglement in, in very big systems. Uh, Marco and Maxime were super helpful for the, the numerics on uh, matrix product operators. And uh, Ignacio Sirac and Peter Zoller are always useful and uh, they provided incredible uh, help for, uh, to understand what was the, the impact of, of this idea. Okay, so don't hesitate to ask questions if something isn't clear. So uh, to define a protocol, I need to define what I want to measure. Okay, so for, for the purpose of this talk, it's sufficient for me to discuss uh, first entanglement entropies, okay, and then I will generalize to more complicated things, but for a moment, you can just consider I'm, I have in mind a pure state living in AB, that's my quantum computer. If I want to see if A is entangled with B in this pure state picture, it is sufficient to calculate uh, entanglement entropy of a reduced density matrix in A. And uh, in particular, I'm interested in the Rényi entropy, which is the one which is measurable for us. The second expression, we know entanglement entropies uh, play a fundamental role in quantum information, like it's like the number one quantity that you, you see in, in quantum information nodes. They quantify quantum resources for, in particular, communication. Uh, maybe more important for this conference, uh, in quantum simulation, entanglement entropy turned to be a very useful uh, order parameter for complex phases. You can think of 
critical, critical states at a quantum phase transition. You can think of topology, you can think of uh, dynamics. And uh, this was used for a long time uh, in numerical simulation, quantum Monte Carlo, dear Margie, to understand uh, a given Hamiltonian. Uh, and this gave hope that if one day you can measure entanglement entropies in, in a lab, uh, quantum simulation will benefit from that because it's only in a synthetic quantum system that you can think about measuring such a, a crazy quantity, right? I also like this last point about quantum advantage. The entanglement entropy is by essence limited in a tensor network architecture. So if you want to, to develop a quantum technological device, and if you can prove that in this device, the entanglement entropy is below some threshold, you have some claim of quantum advantage with respect to the tensor networks. So uh, now let me focus specifically on the Rennie entropy. We know it uh, quantifies entanglement. It's the log of trace rho square. Trace rho square is called the purity. It's one if and only if the state is pure. So if I measure purity, I measure the, the entanglement entropy by taking the log. It's exactly the same thing. And uh, you will see that uh, what I will say about the purity can be then generalized. So that's a good starting point for my explanation, if you want. In order to measure a purity in an experiment, there are basically two uh, families of protocols being used at the moment in experiments. I will mostly focus on uh, randomized measurement, which you see on the, on here on the left. The advantage of this is that you it's the, the circuit that you have to do for measuring is the same as in tomography. So you have a single instance of your quantum state. You perform randomized um, basis transformations, so this U1, U2, Un, or single qubit rotations. Here they are taken at random. And then this is followed by a projective measurement, give you, giving you a classical bit string which is the data that you will then analyze, okay? Uh, so I want to emphasize this is not tomography. Okay? This is the, the data acquisition procedure of tomography, but I will do something else than tomography with the data, okay? In particular, uh, what has been shown with randomized measurements is that the purity can be mapped to the data with an analytical function, which, which has a very simple form. Okay? So there is this kind of bridge between data and, and entanglement entropies. And it's simply an average, so I have to compute uh, some, some, some form of average over my data. The second family are called bail basis measurement. This is an earlier a protocol which was proposed earlier. So at this time you have two copies of your, of your quantum state, so it's, it's more demanding uh, as a circuit. And then you have to couple these two copies and measure in a single basis. Uh, and this is particularly used in, uh, in Rydberg atoms, in, in the experiment of Michel Lukin, for instance. But uh, it's difficult to use it in different, in other platforms, like the trapped ions and the, the superconducting qubits typically don't have that. So I will focus on, on the randomized measurement part uh, for what comes next. But keep in mind that this other method exists, and in particular the, the statement that I will be able to make Later, we'll apply to, to both, uh, both ideas, okay. So, uh, this is like the cartoon for randomized measurements. It's actually a bit simplified. It's too simplistic uh, for, for what I want to say. Uh, this is now how uh, a current randomized measurement looks like in the lab. Uh, this is a picture from a, a paper we did with IBM, where the, the aim was to measure the purity and also other quantities, and uh, it looks like this. So you have two blocks. Okay. You have the blocks of uh, data acquisition, okay, here. That's the experimental task, and then you have the block of post-processing, which happens on a classical computer, typically by, by the theories. So what happened in, in data acquisition is uh, independent of what you want to measure. It's very important, it's a single 
experimental recipe. If you have it in the lab, you can do many things. So it starts with a calibration procedure where you apply the unitaries that you, you want it to apply, but there is some noise in the experiment, and it's very important to be aware of that and accept this fact. And this calibration step uh, aimed at learning this additional noise uh, in the experiment. And one important fact, which was discovered uh, recently, is that when you start with randomized measurement uh, in the first place, if you have additional noise on top, there is a sort of effective averaging of the noise due to the fact that you are using random unitaries. It's called a twirling in, in quantum information. This noise, in the end, in, is summarized by what we call calibration parameters. So there's just uh, some list of numbers that you have to learn when you are ready to, for the next step, which is the measurement. In the second step, uh, one performs the actual measurement on, on the quantum state of interest. And we construct, uh, here we, we construct classical shadows, so it's, it's a form of randomized measurement that I will explain. And the experimental step of data acquisition is over. You can uh, store the, these results and go to a post-processing stage. And the post-processing stage, uh, there are many ways. I, I will focus on one, which will be explained later. It's just you load the data on the classical computer, and then you, you estimate uh, entanglement entropies or other things with a formula. It's, it's, it's really simple. So how does it look, this post-processing? Uh, there were a lot of work uh, recently about this classical shadows. It was briefly mentioned in the other talk. Classical shadows are a representation of your data, which is information complete in the sense that if you have infinitely many measurements, you actually have the quantum state represented. And it's a simple function of the data in the sense that my data uh, S is a measured bit string. U is the unitary I applied. So this, this object uh, I know. F is the noise parameter that I measured independently. I can build this object uh, as a tensor product on my classical computer. And the key, uh, key result about classical shadows, what I need here, is that in expectation value, I know that this, sorry, I know that this object is equal to the density matrix. This does not mean uh, I will do tomography here. I just know that in expectation value, this object is the density matrix. And all the tricks of randomized measurements consist in building statistical estimators of functions of a density matrix based on this relation. Okay. So typically, I will sum over these shadows and then contract and so on. And I will obtain exact relations between data represented by shadows to, uh, in my case, purity. Okay. You can play uh, many tricks. Uh, with very uh, simple tricks of statistics. I will not spend so much time on this. What is important uh, maybe to, to finish about this in, uh, introduction is to say that uh, typically the experiment with uh, randomized measurement are done uh, with order 100,000, 1 million measurements. Sometimes it was uh, several million measurements. This is how you, this is what you need typically for, for the kind of plot that I will show. Okay. So here's an example of uh, a recent uh, measurement of a purity in a, in a supercondenting quantum device. Okay, so good news is, you see the x-axis. You can measure a purity uh, up to n equal 13. And uh, we are quite happy about this because it's a decent, small, many-body Hilbert space that we have here. And um, what is also nice to see is that when you are using this robust method, okay, which came from last year, there is a purity of order 1, 0, 9, for these pretty large systems. So I feel sometimes it's a bit unfair to call this device noisy, quantum device, uh, yeah. uh, quantum uh, NISC and all that. These are pretty good pure states, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, it's, a, it's an unbiased estimate. So typically, if I would repeat uh, this experiment many times, uh, my, my estimator will be symmetrically distributed uh, around the exact value. That's, uh, That's a question? Okay, thanks. So robust is, is this uh, updated method. Uh, and we believe it's that's the true purity, okay? The blue one. The standard one is the one uh, without noise mitigation. And it is uh, much lower, okay? Because what happens is that while you are measuring, you are, uh, you are putting some noise so the purity of the state decays effectively, right? So we are measuring some kind of uh, state affected by the measurement itself. So, uh, yeah. I know, I don't know. This you cannot. Uh, so, for instance, if you have a spontaneous emission in the system with uh, a single qubit, uh, the purity will actually increase with time because you will progressively go to the, to the ground state. It's non-trivial, but how it should behave, yeah? That's a good question. Yeah, it's completely independent, yeah. That's, um, uh, that's why I'm here, uh, I want to know. Uh, <laughs> So that's, that's what I propose, and uh, <laughs> let's see. What I, what I can say is that uh, the experimental recipe looks simple to us, and, and we were happy that some, some groups started using it, uh, in particular Google and, and IBM, uh, also Innsbruck. And uh, so that's some kind of established tools uh, at the moment. So now I can comment on some uh, technical details, uh, which will be important for, for the rest of this talk, if it is a uh, fine review. So, uh, I'll start with the bad news. Uh, for purity, we know that this uh, protocol requires exponentially many measurements. Okay. And it is expected, because we are probing a, a very non-trivial quantity here, summarizing uh, entanglement, right? What I want to emphasize is that the corresponding exponential scaling has a coefficient a, which is of order one. So we are exponential, okay? But it's not tomography. Tomography, uh, the scaling is four to the n for uh, rank one, eight to the n for uh, maximum rank. So it's exponentially better than uh, tomography. This is why these measurements are possible for much larger than what you have with tomography, and much better precision, actually. Still, uh, you, you end up with, uh, you see in these plots, the, the error bar starts to increase, and uh, I'm not showing 14, obviously. What we liked about it is that it's uh, robust. So under very typical assumptions for noise, we know that this is the right purity that we measure, and this is a quantitative estimation that the experimentalists now use, uh, you know, to, to verify uh, quantitatively how the device behaves. So if, if the purity is low on Monday, maybe you have to work a bit on Tuesday to, to improve the device, and these sort of things, but things that they tell us. And the framework is uh, so general that you can measure uh, many other things like purities. And uh, over the years, we, we played a lot, uh, in particular with, with Pasquale Calabrese, to, to measure uh, over entropies and uh, entanglement quantifiers. So this was fun. And if you want more about uh, what can you measure, uh, what is the protocol, what is the error bar, we, we just put a review last year uh, together with the Caltech group, which kind of summarizes what, what we've done there. So now uh, I come to the, the second part of this talk about uh, a new upgrade to, to this toolbox, which is uh, how to measure the, the entropies and purities with uh, polynomially many measurements instead of exponential.
And uh, the starting point for us is that uh, we spent so much time uh, to develop uh, this toolbox that we, we would like someone to, to keep using it, if possible. So if I have in mind uh, a very, la very large systems, I know that the only thing I will be able to do with existing uh, toolbox is that I can extract the purity of blocks. So I will have uh, here this block I1, I2, I3, I4. This is what I can do, measure the purity there. I can also imagine that I, I can measure the purity in pairs of blocks like I2, I3. I know I can measure this very well. The question we were asking is, can we somehow use this uh, measurement of the local purities to find the purity of a global system? This is called in, in quantum information, uh, quantum marginal problem. It has been studied a lot for von Neumann entropy. Uh, for purity, it was, uh, it was open, actually. Uh, and the answer is, uh, is yes, there is a formula. And this is the result I will present. Okay. But I start with uh, the end, actually. The result is there is a formula. And we think it's useful because now we have, with existing uh, toolbox, and, uh, which is already in the lab, we have a way to, to build an entropy meter. We can measure um, extensive entropies and all these sort of uh, nice things, uh, basically today. OK? So uh, to show the formula, uh, I will use tensor network notations because I, I like them. And I find they, they are intuitive to describe entanglement. It's a toy model, OK, to find a formula. And then I will show that this formula is actually general for typical states with short range entanglement. So I, I will put the physics assumption a bit later. But let's just see how it goes. So tensor network, uh, we have seen many interesting talks uh, just consisting in representing matrices and tensors uh, graphically. So a single qubit density matrix uh, is, a, is a box with two legs. Now I want to make uh, an entanglement quantum state. So the first rule I need to know is uh, gate operation, unitary operation. We know that it is u rho u dag. So Graphically, it's like that. It's, it's really obvious for most of you. And now uh, I have my toy model. I start with uh, the minimal size I need for the formula is uh, 12 qubits. I start initially with a mixed state because I want to make general claims about mixed state. And I apply uh, two qubit gates. It's a depth two quantum circuit because you have two layers, okay? And you see that with such a circuit, I generate a little bit of entanglement, but not too much, okay? And the question I'm asking is, uh, is there a close relation between the purity of uh, a big block of this system, I will consider uh, the first six qubits, as a function of a purity of the smaller blocks? If I'm not able to find a formula there, there is no formula, because it's really the simplest I can, I can propose for, for a circuit. So now the purity looks like this. Uh, it is the reduced density matrix on the first six qubits, OK? So I have to trace out the last six qubits. So I contract when I put a, a red dot. It means I, there is a kind of a link contracting this thing, OK? Pink also here for the second copy. I have two reduced density matrix over there. And then purity is trace row square. So on the A part, I have to multiply the two matrices together. So that's why it's the same color here. I contract like that. And I contract uh, the full thing afterwards, trace row square. So uh, do you have an, an idea how I can simplify this to, to get uh, a simple expression? OK, it's OK. So uh, here, for instance, you see that I multiply a gate with its uh, Hermitian conjugate. So I have u times u dag. I know its identity. So this is the rule I can use to, to simplify my, my tensor network. 
And what I obtain is the following. The purity is a product of numbers. Okay, so here I have rho square, rho square, and so on. So I have a product of numbers. And at the edge, I have this uh, strange number, which is due to the fact that the qubit number six is entangled with qubit number seven. So the reduced density matrix on six qubits is mixed because of this entangling link. So this has to be there. And uh, people from, I uh, think, statistical physics or, or many body physics are not surprised, but the purity has an extensive contribution uh, coming from uh, the fact that I started from uh, an extensive state in terms of entropies. And it has an edge contribution because I created entanglement at a given edge. So we were happy to see this because uh, the hope survives. There, there might be a way to simplify this further to express these numbers in terms of local purities, quantities that I can measure. And this, uh, I will skip, okay? I will ask you to believe me. If you compute uh, these tensor diagrams for subsystems, one, two, three, four, five, six, you will see this same kind of terms appearing. And in the end, you will see that you can combine these subsystem purities in this form, uh, which I like very much. The purity of A is the purity of two overlapping blocks. So I have A1, A2, and then A2, A3. I'm able to uh, uh, make this product, and then since I counted A2 twice, I divide by trace rho square A2. Okay. So there is simple fraction to estimate global purities from, from local purities solving, if you want, the, the, the marginal problem there. Okay. And this extends trivially to uh, many blocks, uh, any system size. You multiply the purities uh, with the overlapping blocks, and you divide by the purity of the blocks. This gives you a formula which is exact uh, for the toy model. Okay, now uh, I'm done with the toy model, I want to make better claims, claims which are typical for quantum states. Okay, so if you have questions, don't hesitate on it. Yeah. Quantum? Uh, I think it is used in this, in this follow-up work on, on 1D Gibbs states, but uh, I would be interested in hearing your opinion. Yeah. For the toy model, you saw I didn't use any theorem, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's just a name, but uh, it, 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 it's one state, right? Hmm? Ah, yes. It's because I have two layers, yeah. If I would have any number of layers, uh, I, I could... Uh, It holds, yes, it holds, but I need a larger block size. Uh, I, here, the block size um, is involving two qubits. Okay. If I will have depth four, I will need uh, four qubits in the block. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I. I I think I agree with you, it's, it's a toy model which is uh, instructive by itself. Yeah. Uh, still, w we want it to be uh, a bit more complete and we uh, took uh, now, to extend this proof, we took a matrix product density operators, so tensor network for mixed states. And then what we showed is that uh, the same formula holds, okay, and we know that MPDO are a good representation of Gibbs states of in 1D. The same formula holds up to corrections which are exponentially small in a typical length of a system, which is the correlation length, obviously. Meaning, uh, if you go to the lab, measure this, you will be exponentially close to the right purity, and you can actually check that by 
increasing the size k, k is the size of this block, you can try many k's, and then at some point you will see it's guaranteed that you will converge to the right value, exponential convergence. Okay. So what good news, the toy model provided the right, the right formula. And uh, there was a recent work, very nice, by a, a team from Spain, showing that more, perhaps more rigorously that this holds for any Gibbs state, this, this property. And now uh, I want to conclude on this part and explain the uh, practical consequences of this. And uh, if you take uh, this formula here, we know the statistical errors in randomized measurement for estimating each of these terms. Okay, so the only thing we have to do now, which is left, is do the error propagation that we make when we multiply these, these numbers together. And our final result is the following, that if you want to estimate the purity up to a given relative error, and relative error is important here because we are talking about uh, potentially exponentially small numbers, the error that you make can be bounded using a polynomial number of measurement. And this is somehow uh, for the expert uh, proven by, by this term. Okay, we have a L cube for the system size. Okay. So summarizing, the, the formula uh, uses randomized measurements to measure the purity in a, in a, in a large system, okay, depends what you can do in a lab. And uh, this concludes this part on the purity. Okay. So now uh, I think I have uh, a bit, uh, still a bit of time to, to go on. 10 minutes, wonderful. Uh, I will perhaps not talk too much about this uh, numerical verification of the scaling. Uh, I, I can explain for, for experimentalist uh, that we can actually predict how many measurements you would need to measure a certain block size, a certain total system. Uh, this is mostly technical. Uh, I would like to use uh, the, the last minutes to, to discuss about uh, entanglement detection of, of mixed states to, to present how these ideas could also be applied in, in this context. So now I, have, uh, I want to discuss mixed state entanglement. So remember, the beginning of this talk, I had A and B in a pure state. I want to, to go beyond and treat uh, noisy systems or subsystems. I have A, B in an environment. I want to check if A is, a, is entangled with B, a long-standing topic in, uh, in quantum information theory, of course. And uh, in our case, what we found useful is to uh, study entanglement detection in the context of uh, a positive partial transpose condition, PPT, from uh, Perez and Orodecki. So uh, we are not measuring the purity anymore. We are measuring the moments of the partial transpose density matrix. It's a, it's a linear operation you can do in the density matrix. And I forgot to put the power n here. So I take a partial transpose and then moments of that. And um, something that we found a long time ago now is that these numbers that you can measure with randomized measurements can, detect, can be used to detect entanglement. So if the third moment is smaller than the square of the second moment, it implies the state is, entanglement, is, is entangled. It's a condition which is uh, weaker than PPT. Uh, but, uh, okay. And uh, this is uh, an experimental demonstration of this, um, of this uh, entanglement detection in a, in a trapped ion system. Uh, actually, I like to tell this story because it, it, was, uh, it was interesting that uh, the entanglement detection was discovered experimentally. So we were looking at this uh, plot, uh, not at this y-axis, but we are looking at P2, P3, and then we felt uh, but P3 was kind of small when the entanglement was expected to be there. Uh, so it's really uh, looking at the experimental data which helped us to, to find some interesting theory. So that's why I, 
That's what I like about measuring entanglement is that the experiment stimulates your theory. And then you do a little bit of math, it's very simple, you find this condition. Okay, so this is, this is what happened. And it turns out this, these conditions are quite powerful. You can generalize them to any order Pn and then slowly go to a PPT case. You can also show uh, using PT moments. It's a work by Matteo uh, Voto within the audience. But you can detect different types of entanglement. For instance, if it is generated by a Clifford circuit or not. It's also there. So obviously, uh, when we found this... Uh, this new upgrade to a toolbox, we thought uh, it would be nice to see if we can detect entanglement with polynomially many measurements uh, using the same trick as for purity. So what we did was what we uh, derived, uh, we proposed to measure these PT moments in a rescaled way. So we take the, the PT moment Pn and we divide it by uh, these numbers, which are also measurable. This is just a trick to focus for our statistical error on the absolute errors. I know this number is of order one, so I just need to study absolute errors. And using the same tricks as before, uh, decomposing in blocks, multiplying the blocks together, you can show that this number P and tilde can be measured with polynomially many measurements. And now, uh, the only thing I need to check uh, to conclude is that I need to check that for typical states in experiments, the PNPPT condition is violated. Okay. This is actually a hard problem to know if a, a state uh, it is, um, the entanglement of a given state is detected by a given criterion. There we did the mix. Okay. So we took uh, a 1D GIP state uh, simulated by uh, tensor networks. We went up to uh, fairly large system sizes, and we studied uh, the detection of P3 PPT and P5 PPT, the next one, as a function of L and beta. And we found that actually, if the temperature is not so high, there is a big region actually where the protocol would detect entanglement. But we can make this claim. And what is interesting is that you see this kind of slope, okay? If you analyze uh, this slope, what it means in terms of the purity, you will find that uh, you will stop detecting entanglement when the purity, oh, let me put it this way, if the entanglement entropy becomes more than order one. Okay? If the entropy, entanglement entropy becomes extensive, uh, P3 PPT will fail. And I think it's not so much of a surprise that if the state is permeable in the sense that entanglement entropy is extensive or looks extensive for this system size, uh, it fails. But interestingly, if you move to the next, uh, next condition, the, the better one, P5, the slope uh, vanishes and you get something which looks like more a vertical line and um, in this new region, I mean, it was a big surprise, okay, but maybe it was not uh, for, for you. Uh, in this region, I'm able to detect entanglement even though the entanglement entropy is large, or, or the n, uh, and the purity exponentially small. So it's actually uh, surprising to me and this entanglement detection can be done with polynomially many resources. So with this, I conclude. I think I, I presented a, a funny result on how to measure uh, entanglement uh, entropies in, in state-of-the-art experiments. Uh, I'm very happy to, to discuss about uh, maybe if it can be used for, for machine learning application. I, I would love that. Uh, I think I can say it can be used for typical quantum simulation tasks, like measure, classifying quantum phases and so on. Um, we are working on now the tomography. So can we use approximate factorization conditions, so this expression in terms of blocks for learning about a quantum state. And we're also uh, working on 2D. 
uh, we believe actually uh, there is a formula for 2D. I can write it down, but I'm not able to prove uh, apart from a toy model that this formula uh, give, will give me the exact purity uh, after some block size. So I'm not able to prove, so I would be very happy to collaborate on trying this numerically. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Benoit. More questions. Thank you very much, Benoit. Uh, I have two things. So uh, I understand that this uh, moment, moment no, of the uh, PPT is much easier to calculate at the whole matrix and do PPT, no? Yeah. Because you only have to calculate the diagonal and you have all the moment there. And there is a, uh, so you know that there is PP3, PP5, but there is a hierarchy there proven that it should be like yeah. that. Mm. So it's always a hierarchy that it's proven. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a result by Otfried Gunner who proved that uh, PN uh, PPT is w strictly weaker than PN plus one PPT. Okay. And then if you go to P2 to the power N, it's exactly um, PPT, equivalent to PPT. One thing that I wanted to ask you is that you, s so well, but it's weaker than PPT. No, it's weaker, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, no, no, but it's very nice. Yeah. The second thing that I wanted to ask you, let me remember. Yeah, you were saying that also this purity measure, it's better than the uh, von Neumann entropy measure, no? In the sense of, uh, if you measure uh, Rennie entropy too, yeah. this is better, or more accurate, uh, or? I wouldn't know how to measure von Neumann entropy uh, from randomized measurements. Ah. But, uh, but in this PPT, for instance, you have to do partitions with respect to everything, no? Because this is a bipartite thing, so you have yeah. to calculate a lot of things, okay. The yeah, good yeah, thing is I understand. can do this partitioning uh, after I measure, I have, I have the full data and I, I can compute that. Hey, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I have a question, not sure how silly it is. Did you ever think about combining sort of these results for this particular problem of entangled detection with uh, kind of guessing a good entanglement witness? I have not seen a any mention of entanglement witnessing and you're talking about entanglement detection, so you have an opinion? Yeah. So what we would like to do is to try to avoid using entanglement witnesses because uh, it's not clear uh, what is the best entanglement witness that you need for a given quantum state. So what we would like to have is a single quant quantity you have to measure and then you hope that you can make a conclusion about it. Uh, I'm thinking more in this machine learning thing, right? Because if you can guess, if you can learn the right entanglement witness, then this would be the most efficient way to confirm yeah, and that would be right. nice thing. Okay. So we, we haven't done that. Any more questions? Um, I'm actually super surprised that, uh, like polynomially many measurements, that this is ever possible. So could it be? Uh, so uh, there was one thing, one point where I was wondering a bit uh, practically. So in the end when you want to get this exponential convergence, uh, you need smaller and smaller blocks. So in the end, you deal with longer and longer products of purities that you have yeah. to compute. Now, I, is it, could it be that actually, like I could imagine that like errors can actually proliferate rather strongly in the end so that you might practically yeah. be back to an exponential problem in an actual experiment? Actually, the error propagation is, is linear, and uh, I will show you this with, a, with an example. But it's counterintuitive. It was, to me, counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. um, you take this formula here, uh, take the log on both sides. Yeah. yeah. And instead of multiplying this thing, you will add the, the log, OK? Yeah. The log of uh, or quantities, which will be of order 1 over to the k, where k is a block size. Okay, so uh, I can estimate this with a fixed additive error, which will not depend on the total system because it's just a property, local property on k, right? Yeah, but like a, mm -hmm. a given block, the effort does not scale with the total system size, okay? The only remaining thing I need to do is to do the error propagation of n terms, and you see that uh, 
if these n terms are measured independently, I will pay a price n square because of the covariance effects. Uh, you see what I mean? Yeah. Yes, but I, I mean, maybe we, we discuss uh, this later, but it's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Let's thank the speaker again.